do bumblebees sting? Yeah, it's a classic question. Bumble they can be quite fearsome because they're big and they're noisy, they buzz a lot, but bumblebees generally don't sting. They can sting, and the classic thing is if you sit on one or you get one in your clothing, then they may panic and they may sting. But basically they have a sting with barbs, and if they sting, the poison sac is pulled out with their innards as well, so it's a one-off. Oh, that's so they, they're not aggressive and they don't try to sting. They, they try not to sting. I'm half right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that? Every time I, get my I think now, that I might be a tree bee uh, ooh, with the orange thorax. Uh, I mean, these two are rolling in it. Yeah, they are, aren't they? They're just going absolutely ballistic. They are. They are. With some of the solitary bees, they collect both nectar and pollen, and obviously they collect nectar in the at the front end. They they scoop it up, yeah. but in the pollen they collect on the hairy legs. And there are some of the solitary bees which actually have very narrow nest holes and they can't turn round. So if they're offloading a load of nectar, they go in head first. If they're offloading pollen, they have to reverse in. It's a bit like delivery lorries. <laughs> There's quite a lot of bumblebees with yellow and black in various patterns and with either buff or white yes. bottoms. <laughs> So you need to think about that. Yeah. But you, we'll show you some pictures. Christine was going to talk about some of the, the books and we've got a couple more over there uh, to cover some of that. So you're kind of looking at the, the shape. Well, the bumblebees are all bumblebee shaped mm -hmm. and the cuckoo bees are also bumblebee shaped because mm -hmm. they're parasite, parasitizing the others. And then you're looking at the predominant color, the background color is black. And then you're looking at what are the stripes on that? Are they yellow? Are the yellow stripes individual, or are they, you know, merged into uh, yeah. bigger blocks? And then the tail is a tail white, buff, or in some cases red. Yeah. And there's somewhere the whole body is red. The whole body is black apart from the tail, which is red. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have we'll, we'll go through some of the main species, and we'll try and grab a few in a minute. There's not a great deal of species variation at the moment. I'm only getting two main species of bumblebees. So that may be the time of year, maybe the weather, whatever. Uh, but I've got a couple of other things here to show you. The first one was just to say about the things that you really need if you're going to look for these things. And they're actually incredibly cheap. I don't know if the group are going to buy any or if the individual want to get them. You can go onto the web and you can buy these little plastic containers. They're often marketed for kids' educational activities. Um, they're probably, you know, you can probably get six or eight of these for under £10, something like that. And they've got like a little magnifying glass on there. Whoop, I don't want that to come out yet. No, that's right. So you've got a magnifying glass at the top. See, that one's actually... I managed to get a flower, so it's quite happy. It's on a... Uh, buttercup flower and it's one of the mining bees if you want to pass that around and have a look sort of greyish slight, it's like a honeybee but smaller sort of grey bodied and slightly downy head now I was going to say if I can just borrow that one back for a second yes yeah. yep yeah. so this field study council guide is you know very very helpful very useful it's not comprehensive I do like Michael Chinnery's Insects Collins Guide, and you can get this again on the internet second hand. Other things that you need, a little container such as we've got there, and a net. Now, I, this one, again, it's sold as a kid's butterfly net, and it's pretty good. And it, it wasn't terribly expensive. You know, for professional ones, you can be paying a lot of money. But I think this is actually, you know, very much fit for purpose. And I have in here So I did have in here. Where? Oh there, it's hidden away, isn't it? Right. 
I want to get him into the jar in a minute. So a net is a good thing to have, particularly for the butterflies and moths, because you will struggle otherwise. And for some of these more mobile solitary bees, then again the net is quite handy. For the bumblebees, you just get your little plastic container, walk up to a flower and gently put the two bits together. And they don't generally notice until they find that they're in a, a jar. That's the tree bumblebee. And what I'm finding most is that those are the two species I'm finding. So that suggests that there are some tree bumblebee sites somewhere nearby, which is expected near a building. Or if there's any trees with bits of hollow, they'll nest in those. Probably. <laughs> so this sort of thing here. Yeah. I mean, the, the one that we've got there is quite small. So, bombus, a uh, white-tailed bumblebee, mm. slightly bigger. Um, garden bumblebee, that's the typical one in the garden. And we, what, what you're looking for here... The garden bumblebee is the ones we got, this thing was about one and a half twice the size Yeah, that. yeah. Now the size varies because the queen is the biggest, but the workers vary and the workers start off early in the year quite small because in the nest you've not got much oh, food. Well, yeah. Like yeah. I was going to say, with, with its legs, I mean, it could probably be... As it takes off, you get more and more food and they get bigger and bigger. How can you tell if you said one was a tree and one was a buff tail? But yeah. The, this one's got a buff tail. That's the buff tail. Oh, no, which one are you looking at? That's a tree. Tail. Yeah, if you look at the, th the thorax, uh. see it's got a buff tail. Uh. It's got no yellow. Uh. It's just black. And then the thorax, which is a bit, they split into three parts, the head, yeah. the thorax, the joining bit, and then the abdomen. Yeah. So the abdomen in this is black yeah. with a buff tail. Yeah. And then the thorax is a sort of gingery brown. So, so interesting that they are going for different, slightly different habitats, which is good. It's not very happy, this one. Um, but that was a, that's a technique for these. You just sneak up on it and close the the jar and there we've got one of the carder bees the brown carder bee common carder bee uh, which is also known as bombus pascuorum so I'll pass that round this is predominantly brown orangey brown no other markings they can be considerably bigger than this so again as I say size is a bit unhelpful it's early in the season for bees still relatively early so they are relatively small in this case but that's nice to see that's another another species one that we should get here and i would like you to look out for uh if i can find where so it is it is a bumblebee yeah it's a, it's a carder bumblebee a bit like having early, early bumblebees. <laughs> so there's another one which is called Bombus Monticola. Well, you can hear that with the speed yeah. of the humming and yeah. the buzzing. Yeah, yeah. And it's around. That's, what the hell am I doing in here? Monticola refers to mountain. It's like the garden bumblebee is hortus. Bombus hortus, so horticultural. So... Bombus monticola is the bumblebee, is the bilberry bumblebee, which is a northern species and it's relatively rare. And Blackamoor, not far from here, is an important site for them. So you want moorland, but ideally moorland with quite a lot of bilberry on it. And I don't think we're going to find one today, unfortunately, but if we did, it's this little jobby down at the bottom here. Unmistakable, it's got a little white head and it's got a really orange abdomen. Oh. So quite a bright little thing. Yeah. So that is one to look out for. Yeah. And I've noticed that you have got quite lots of lavender being planted on here. Yeah. It may, it won't be at its best this year. It take, often takes a year or two years to get to its peak. When it does, that will be brilliant for bumblebees. They will love that. So I'll pass this round. It's the one 
Uh, second one in on the bottom, Monticola, the Bilberry Bumblebee. Oh. <laughs> so we've got a honeybee, right we've got a, a worker honeybee here. So just a bog standard honeybee. And there's bound to be people nearby with um, uh, colonies. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. So there's loads coming in. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a honeybee. That's a honeybee. Honeybee. And then this was one of the buff tailed which I'm going to let go. Oh, uh, bilbies. Thank you. Right. Okay, that's all. Come on. Because now he's now she. Oh. <laughs> I have a great problem walking across our lawn at the moment because it's so full of bees, you're having such a right... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, off it goes. That's good. Oh, and there the tree bee again. And you can see how that differs. This, is, this has got a browny thorax, but quite different from, oh, it's quite tiny, isn't it? from the one we've got there. You get the whites which are the ones which you're generally familiar with. And here, the ones that you will get in some number will be uh, the early butterflies, which we did see on previous visits, green veined white and orange tip white. Then got the, the whites, which uh, generally are pests on uh, the cabbage family. And again, you just find them on any bit of waste ground and in people's gardens. Um, and then you've, you've got things like the blues, so common blue. For some of the blues and some of the things like small copper, small heath, things like that, you actually want bits of nice grassland nearby. Preferably lots of bird's foot trefoil, because that's one of the things that they're feeding on. Um, so you're then casting around to where are the nice bits of grassland. Well, one bit is over where the bees are in the fields there. They look, those fields look really good. You know, outside the park boundary, but that area looks very, very good. And then the other area which we're looking at on Friday from a grassland point of view are the playing fields at the lower side. And that will provide, if you can get the right breeding habitat there, because what the browns and the skippers like, for example, is fairly rough grass. The things like coxfoot grass and stuff like that. If you've got them there, they will then come in here to feed. <coughs> you know, they'll come to your buddleia, they'll come to the other flowers. They won't be, the larvae are not going to have any chance in this habitat, but that doesn't matter because we can get them in. There's a bullfinch there. There's a bullfinch calling. So do they fly, how far are they likely to fly? Well, I mean, they, some of the big butterflies can fly a thousand miles. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so for them, for coming from the fields down there, up here into the park where the flowers are, it's, you know, very, very easy, yeah. So this is why we're looking at the wider area because we want to get the habitat right in here. There's a lot we can do to enhance the habitat here, but then you want to cast around to other opportunities in the wider landscape. So if we want the nettle patches, I'm sure there are places along Rycroft Glen where you could get nettles doing quite well. I'm sure there's places on the far side that wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, we need to be thinking about things like the butterflies and, you know, today we're not seeing very many and I would expect more. You know, it's not the peak yet, but we are getting, um, I was out on site in, in the East Riding last week and we were getting peacocks and red admirals and stuff like that coming in. The red admirals are migrating in from the continent, they're arriving. I didn't see any painted ladies, but I would expect them to be following. So you want to get the habitat right. But it's a matter of then looking both in the park, but also looking beyond the park at what we can do, you know, what we can do to enhance the wider habitat. Okay.